Welcome back to another episode of Practical Electronics and Circuits 101, where I explain the fundamentals of circuits with a focus on using this knowledge for practical applications and projects. The link to the full playlist is in the video description in case you want to get caught up with the previous videos. Today I'll be talking about semiconductors as we start to get into active components. I'll also go over diodes in more detail and show common examples of how to use them. So let's first start by going over what active components are and the main differences when compared to passive components, which include resistors, capacitors, inductors, and transformers, all of which I've already covered in previous videos. These are considered passive components because they don't require external power to work correctly. In other words, there's no minimum voltage or any other requirements for them to operate as intended. Their functionality is inherent in their design. Active components, on the other hand, do require a certain voltage to operate correctly. Active components include a wide range of devices including diodes, transistors, integrated circuits, and more. Active components can be thought of more as a device rather than a component because they're composed of smaller pieces and require certain conditions to operate correctly. Active components also fall into a category known as semiconductors, which are a special type of metal that are found in every integrated circuit and chip. Semiconductors are directly responsible for the electronics revolution that society has experienced over the last few decades. Some examples of semiconductors include germanium, gallium arsenide, and silicon, which is by far the most common semiconductor today. Now I won't be spending too much time talking about the science behind semiconductors since the focus of the series is to get started on some practical projects, but I think it's still good to at least have a basic understanding of what semiconductors are and how they work. So let's start with the very basics and look at the periodic table of elements. Silicon, germanium, and gallium arsenide are all in this green region here that's classified as semi-metals. In general, metals are typically conductive of electricity while non-metals are typically not conductive. Semi-metals sit in a gray area between conductive and non-conductive, which is where the name semiconductor comes from. This means their conductive properties can be altered in a useful way by applying impurities, or other elements, in a process called doping. Now the reason why some elements are conductive is because they contain free electrons and contain an overall negative charge, while non-conductive elements are lacking free electrons. So if a semiconductor such as silicon is doped with elements containing free electrons, then the properties of the silicon will be altered to become a conductor. These are referred to as N-type, where N stands for negative. On the other hand, if silicon is doped with positive charged elements, then the properties of silicon will become non-conductive. These are called P-type, where P stands for positive. N-type and P-type semiconductors are the basis of all active components. Each of these on their own aren't super useful, but when N-type and P-type semiconductors are combined together, then they produce some very interesting and useful properties. To illustrate this, let's imagine a current is flowing from this battery. Now if we combine N-type and P-type semiconductors together and arrange them so that the N-type is connected to the battery's positive terminal and the P-type is connected to the battery's negative terminal, this will stop the current from flowing. But if we were to flip these around so that the N-type is connected to the negative terminal and the P-type is connected to the positive terminal, then current is allowed to flow. This simple configuration is what's known as a diode. So now let's dive into the topic of diodes and do a few examples showing how they're typically used. Here's a simple illustration showing a diode, while the symbol on the bottom is what you'll find on electrical schematics. The white stripe indicates the cathode, or negative terminal, while the positive terminal is known as the anode. The arrow in the symbol indicates which direction the current is allowed to flow. So if the diode is placed in a circuit like this, the current will flow through the circuit and light up the LED. LEDs are also a type of diode themselves, but more on that later. 
Now if we place the diode in this orientation, it will stop the current from flowing and the LED won't light up. However, diodes aren't perfect, so there still will be a tiny amount of current that leaks through the reverse direction diode. This is called the reverse leakage current, but in most cases the amount of current that leaks through is so tiny that it doesn't matter. However, there are other specifications to consider that can make a difference depending on your application. The specs for a specific type of diode can be found in its datasheet. This particular datasheet applies to seven different diode models, which are labeled at the top here. These diodes are all extremely similar to each other, with the main difference being their maximum reverse voltage. We can find that spec here, labeled peak reverse voltage or blocking voltage, and this tells us the maximum DC voltage each diode can block in the reverse direction while the RMS reverse voltage applies to AC voltages. Another important spec is the output current. These particular diodes are small in size and can only handle up to 1 amp. Running more current than this will likely lead to the diodes being damaged from overheating. The forward voltage is another important spec, as this tells you the minimum voltage required in order for the current to flow in the forward direction. These diodes require at least 1 volt in order for the current to start flowing. There will also be a forward voltage drop as well. This particular datasheet doesn't give the exact voltage drop, instead it simply says low forward voltage drop at the top here. We can find out the actual voltage drop by googling it, and according to this, these diodes have a drop of roughly 0.7 volts. So if you applied 5 volts in the forward direction, there would be a 0.7 voltage drop across the diode, leaving only 4.3 volts available for the circuit. The voltage drop will also vary according to temperature and how much current is flowing through it. These are just a few important specs to keep in mind when looking for a diode that will fit your specific needs. But not only are there different models with slight variations, there's also completely different types or classes of diodes. The 1N4000 diodes in the datasheet I just showed are considered rectifier diodes. These are pretty much the same as signal diodes, except rectifier diodes can handle more power. Now Zener diodes are a special type of diode which allows current to flow in the reverse direction once a specific voltage has been reached and they can be used as a stable voltage reference. Shoddy diodes are another type that are similar to rectifier diodes but they have a lower forward voltage drop and faster switching speeds. There's also photodiodes which are special diodes that are sensitive to light. They allow current to flow in one direction when exposed to light. And finally, light emitting diodes, or LEDs for short, are also a type of diode, and they emit light when current flows in the forward direction. Alright, so now let's go over a few examples showing how diodes are commonly used. The first example is using a diode as protection against a current flowing in the wrong direction. Let's say you accidentally connected a battery the wrong way in a device. The current would start flowing through the circuit in the reverse direction, which can potentially damage polarized capacitors, ICs, and other components. In order to protect from this, you could simply place a signal or rectifier diode in series with the power source like this, and it will block the current from flowing in the reverse direction. But keep in mind the voltage will be a little bit lower with the diode because of its forward voltage drop. This means that if we connected a 9 volt battery and used a protection diode with a voltage drop of 1 volt, then our circuit would only receive 8 volts instead of the full 9 volts. In most cases this won't affect the functionality of the circuit, but it depends on the specific circuit. Some diodes also have a much lower voltage drop than 1 volt, so it all depends on your specific needs. Diodes are also commonly found in circuits that contain relays and motors. Both relays and motors have coils in them, and operate using electromagnetic induction, but one side effect from turning off these devices is what's known as back EMF. 
where the collapsing magnetic field in the coil will produce a voltage spike that can damage other components such as the transistors, which power the motor or relay. Diodes can be used as protection from back EMF as well. Alright, so now let's move on to another application for diodes. This time let's look at a guitar pedal. More specifically, a distortion pedal. Now if you're a guitarist, you've probably heard of the term clipping before. Clipping is what creates overdriven and distorted guitar tones. And it's usually done by applying a lot of gain to the signal to the point where the signal will reach the circuit's maximum voltage, and as a result, the top of the sound waves will be flattened out. The gain is usually accomplished by using vacuum tubes, transistors, or op-amps, but there's actually a few different ways to achieve similar results. Diodes can be used to create different types of clipping in combination with an op-amp like we see here in this simple distortion circuit. Sometimes diodes are placed in the feedback loop of the op-amp in order to create what's known as soft clipping, which usually has a smoother sound to it. But this design here also has diodes in the output, which creates a harsher distortion tone. This is called hard clipping. Notice how these two diodes aren't in series with the signal, but rather they're both being pulled to the ground. These will have an effect where they limit the voltage of the signal, which is determined by the diode's forward voltage. This will result in clipping if the signal goes beyond the diode's forward voltage. One diode limits the positive voltage of the signal, while the other diode is placed in the opposite direction in order to limit the negative voltage. Now let's look at another common example for diodes. This is a schematic for a simple 5 volt DC power supply, and we've actually looked at this one a few times before in previous videos where I went over transformers and capacitors. This time let's focus on this part of the circuit where we have four diodes arranged like this. This is what's known as a full wave rectifier, and this is the most common method used for converting AC voltage to DC voltage. Before semiconductors were invented, DC rectification was accomplished by using vacuum tubes. These days there are also specialized ICs that can achieve these same results but using four diodes like this is still the most cost-efficient way to do it. Now if we were to remove two of these diodes, we would have what's called a half-wave rectifier, and what this essentially does is blocks the negative part of the AC signal. But with a full-wave rectifier, the negative part of the AC signal is shifted into the positive side like you see here. But this isn't a pure DC voltage, and it's actually a pulsating signal instead. So in order to smooth out the signal, we can use a capacitor. The bigger the capacitor, the better job it will do at smoothing out the signal. But chances are, it still won't be perfect and will have some ripples in it. Depending on what you're doing, this might be okay, but most of the time you'll want to add a voltage regulator in order to get a smooth DC voltage output. But I'll be talking more about voltage regulators in the next video, and we'll start to get back into hands-on examples as well. In case you're curious on what my planned timeline is, I'm planning to do two more videos in this series before moving on to some projects. The next two videos will go over voltage regulators, power supplies, and then transistors. Transistors are quite an important topic since those will open the door to lots of different projects. After doing a few different projects involving transistors, I plan to come back to the series and periodically introduce new components and ICs. The new components I cover here will likely be followed by a project that utilizes those components. But my channel won't be limited to just electronics projects. I plan to do all sorts of DIY projects that cover different skill sets. But anyway, hopefully you're just as excited as I am to get started on a bunch of different projects. If you learned something today then be sure to give the video a thumbs up and also subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and hit the bell to stay up to date with new videos. And of course, if you have any questions then feel free to leave a comment. As always, thanks for watching and see you all next time.